Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jandia Zubrzycki. I'm director of the Copernicus Center for Polish Studies at the University of Michigan, and I'm also director of the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. And we're thrilled to welcome you to the first event of the winter semester. Um, and we're especially happy to have, um, to start with one of our book club uh, series event uh, with authors Alexandra Lake and Joanna Wawrzeniak, who will discuss their book, Cuts, an Oral History of Transformation. Uh, the book is published in Polish. The title there is Cięcia Mówiona Historia Transformacji, which addresses how Poland rapid socioeconomic transformation in the 1990s uh, is remembered by those who lived it. The book draws, draws on over 130 biographical interviews with chief executives, managers, trade union representatives, administrative staff, and shop floor uh, workers of socialist enterprises uh, that were privatized and sold to multinationals. The book shows the complexity, ambivalence, and tensions inherent to the experience and the memory of socioeconomic change. So the book is really important as a historical document because it, it really brings the voices of interviewees, um, but it's also making bigger claims and greater contributions to, um, to labor history and to, uh, to our understanding of systemic transformations. Um, the book was extremely well received in Poland, uh, sold very well, and it also received Politika's award for the best um, historical book of 2020. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I just want to remind you that uh, we will have a Q&A after the author's uh, presentation and a brief conversation with myself. Um, but at any time during uh, their presentations, you can write a question using the question button at the right, uh, bottom right of your screen. Um, and then I will select the questions and pose them directly to the authors. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Alexandra Lake is a researcher and public policy expert on adult education at the Educational Research Institute in Warsaw. And academically, or in terms of scholarship, she specializes on the social consequences of capitalist transformation of work and the labor market. Joanna Wawrzeniak is Associate Professor of Sociology and Director of the Center for Research on, on Social Memory at the University of Warsaw. She specializes on East Central European memory and is currently conducting research on the memories of socialism, the neoliberal transformation, and deindustrialization processes in Poland. She's also involved in several collaborative research on uh, cultural heritage and memory in Western Europe and Asia. And she has published, you know, she has a long list of impressive publications, both in Polish and English, and I will just cite the most important works uh, published in English. Um, so she's the co-author of The Enemy on Display, The Second World War in Eastern European Museums, published in 2015. And she's the author of Veterans, Victims and Memory, The Politics of the Second World War in Communist Poland, also published in 2015. And she also has co-edited the volumes Memory and Change in Europe, 2016 and Regions of Memory, Transnational Formations, which is forthcoming. Alexandra and Joanna, welcome and thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much, Genevieve, for this invitation. What we wanted to do before we really start talking is to show you uh, some photos from which uh, will take you on a journey, which we also did with our interviewees from the socialist past to today. Ola, would you be able to share the, the, the slideshow? I hope I will be. Um, OK, just a second. Can you see it? Yeah. Right. Uh, so those pictures um, came from one um, of the enterprises uh, we researched. It's um, an automobile company at the moment. Uh, am I right, uh, Asha? <laughs> yeah. 
please, please um, say if there is something wrong, because we uh, there, there were 20, 20, 12 companies we endeavored. Uh, so here we start, uh, we won't talk about each photo, of course, just um, for the beginning. Uh, we are in 1967 uh, 1960, and official opening of the plan with um, Edward, uh, no, it's not Edward Gerek, I'm sorry, it's Gomułka, it's Władysław Gomułka, of course, um, in the middle, um, in the first photo. And then you will see um, the photos from the 70s, 80s, um, from official archives as well as, as well as from uh, private archives and photos from uh, the period of privatization and um, coming of uh, the company, uh, you, I'm sure you know, Michelin, the French Michelin and um, uh, Francois Michelin and his son, Edward Michelin in, uh, in Olsten, in the city, in Masuria district. Okay, so uh, now um, Asha will start the, uh, the presentation and the, and, uh, okay, you can see only one photo, I'm so sorry. They should change. Um, let me stop it for a second and I will check why, why you can see only one photo. So maybe why we fix the, the slide yes, I will start please. my presentation. Okay, so once again, uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be invited to this seminar and thank you a lot Genevieve for making this happen. Uh, we are aware and speaking about the book and the memories of the industrialization in an arbor near Detroit is like carrying calls to Newcastle, bringing sand to the beach or nosić drwa do lasu, as we say in Poland. And yet it's a great opportunity because we believe that although our book is very much anchored in local Polish experience, as you will hopefully see in the pictures in the moment, at the same time it resonates with uh, the industrial process and the neo neoliberal turn worldwide. Because of Zoom fatigue, we agreed with Genevieve that we'll, not, uh, we'll try not to take too much of your time with our presentation and try to leave more time for the Q&A. So we divided our talk uh, between us in a following way that I will sketch you general background in which we would like to see the relevance of this book and Ola will bring you closer to the book itself. So between 2010 and 2016, I had the pleasure to lead a team of researchers and we recorded over 130 biographical narrative interviews with employees of 12 Polish social enterprises that were sold to multinationals in the mid 1990s. Our research related to a critical strand of literature and post socialism in East Central Europe on the one hand, and on the other, to a wider context of labor transformations under global capitalism. It supplemented the earlier studies of transformation in Poland with its focus on how the processes of privatization and industrial reorganization were remembered by post-socialist employees after the decades that had passed since the shock therapy of the 1990s. Our narrators were diverse in terms of gender, class, and political views. What they all have in common is that most of them were born after the Second World War. They began their professional careers in the 1960s and 70s. They spent the most of their professional lives in a single factory. The spaces of experience and the horizons of expectation were shaped by the modernization of Polish industry in the 1970s, based already on Western patterns and loans, by the 1980-81 anti-systemic revolt of the Solidarity Trade Union and social movement, and finally by the country's economic depression in the 1980s. In the prime, they entered a period of transformation which radically changed their workplace and their own lives. In conducting the interviews, we asked for an uninterrupted life story, which we then followed up with questions relating to the interviewees' recollections of work and private lives under socialism and capitalism. 
and to their own evaluation of these two periods of their lives. The cut, the book, is just one among several results of this project, and it aims at general readership. It is not a full-fledged academic study. This is what we left for scholarly articles and at particular audiences. The book, as you can see, is quite thick, and it consists of two, set, uh, two sets of it, our life stories, which were selected and edited uh, by two of us. We contextualize this selection in the historical background of the changes uh, of global capitalism since 1970s, the particularities of Polish transformation to capitalism, and the stories of the particular factories. The aim of this book was to provide the multi-perspective view and not to privilege one interpretation of transformation. Instead of putting on the table the exact solution, the book rather teases its readers and asks them to look for patterns and answers themselves. In a way, one can say that it's a kind of conventional oral history. We start with recalling stats circle hard times, but also oral history books by Lutznit Hammer, Luisa Passerini, Alessandro Portelli, all those great scholars who widened the horizons of the 20th century historiography by adding the, the perspective of histories from below. It also draws on the so-called Polish biographical method in the broad tradition of Florian Zdaniecki, Ludwig Krzywicki, or contemporary scholars of, uh, from the University of Łódź in Poland who are quite good in doing the, the um, autobiographical uh, narrative uh, um, interviews. And certainly it has some elements, the book has some elements of what we expect generally from oral history. There is this co-creation dimension because the interviews, interviews of which some made to this book were collected by a large group of my students and our collaborators in the course of 10 years. And during the interviews, the students were engaged in the long conversation about socialism and transformation to, cap to capitalism with generation of their parents and grandparents. Although they followed the similar pattern of interview, uh, of interview the stories while solicited in this way uh, were certainly impacted by these intergenerational encounters. There is also interventionist dimension in this book. We wanted to interview, intervene in the Polish public discourse and transformation with the polyphony of the stories of its experience. To refer to the well-known distinction of memory studies between communicative memory and cultural memory, in this way, we wanted to strengthen the communicative memory which struggles against cultural and political simplifications. Those of you who are familiar with the transformation discourse in Poland know very well that it is entrapped in a highly antagonistic divide between those who defend the premises of the neoliberal turn and the critics who speak of the betrayal by the elites of the roundtable agreements, the solidarity movement ideas and the common polls. This book does not engage in that divide. Instead, it prefers to open a space of what Anna Chantowul and Hans Lok Hansen after Chantal Mouffe called agonistic memory, which is reflexive and dialogic and acknowledges the perspective of the other, even if it's not able to fully agree with it. And before passing the mic to Ola, I would like to comment on the um, uh, two covers of the book, two alternative covers of the book. Ola, could you show it? You're muted, Ola. Okay, I'm sharing, hopefully successfully this time. Um, okay, for a second, you will see all the slides. I'm sorry, I cannot skip this. Um, okay. Perfect. Perfect. Now, is it okay? Yeah. Yes. yeah. So if you can see the, these two covers, uh, they, they show how the publisher designer was actually struggling with finding a proper photo for the cover. We opened for the second one. 
uh, we found the first one as a very conventional representation that presents the industrial socialist past as a source of irrationality, lagging behind and absurd of the everyday life. And the alternative photo, which eventually became the cover of the book, does not ridicule the work experience under socialism but it opens the space for asking questions on what happened with its legacy today. And on this uh, note, over to you, Ola. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think I will go on and talk about uh, the book now. Uh, and maybe we'll find uh, time to, to show photos later. Should we? Mm -hmm. Okay, you shouldn't see my uh, screen at the moment. You still okay. see your screen. You still see it. Okay. Yeah. You can unshare. Yes. Okay. But no. mm, okay. So, um, what I would like to talk um, about is um, are our general findings, because um, of course our aim was to find some. Um, some shared experience and some common ways of uh, remembering and uh, recalling the stories from the uh, restructuring period and the transformation period. Um, so um, I will divide my talk into parts, um, first around the question of what, and second around the question of how people remembered, recalled and um, narrated their stories. Um, so first question, um, the most uh, recurring and simultaneously challenging uh, motive revealed by the interviews turned out to be layoffs. Um, it's, um, I think it's a good moment to say that um, we usually use the word chencha in this context, personal like job cuts, staff cuts, personal cuts, um, but it's about layoffs, it's about downsizing. Um, so you should know that um, in the early 90s, um, the unemployment rate reached um, 80 percent um, and uh, the number of people uh, with zero percent almost at the beginning to remember about uh, the full employment policy in the socialist regime. Um, and the number of people working in industry decreased uh, from more than um, four millions to less than three millions. So the numbers are really uh, impressing. So it wasn't surprising that the people we talked with, um, all of them experienced layoffs around them. Dozens and very often hundreds of people uh, in their companies um, lost their jobs. Uh, it was very impactful experience, and um, as it turns out, not only for those fired, but also for those who stayed, uh, as they lived in the shade of, um, of layoff, uh, layoffs, actually. Uh, to give an, uh, two examples, um, people um, living in the shade of uh, downsizing were, uh, were unsecure, uncertain about what tomorrow will bring. Um, they started to feel like um, competing with their co-workers um, for surviving in turbulent times um, and um, difficult in the context of difficult labor market, especially local labor market. Um, but also there were people who had to make uh, decisions about who to dismiss and who should stay. Um, so I will give you uh, one example of, um, uh, of a master, of a, uh, of a superior of a group of mechanics from Świecie, it's a paper mill a company um, which was privatized um, by an Austrian company finally. Um, so uh, he had to select himself who would be dismissed uh, without being any external criteria. And uh, he was able to, um, to keep two, uh, two workers out of a group of 20, uh, who, uh, which, which he, he supervised in the, in the 80s. So he knew, uh, he, 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 they knew each other quite well. 
Um, so um, he managed to place some of them in other departments. Um, some of them were able to go what was called uh, pre-retirement allowance. And some of them uh, had different um, sources, dif different economic resources. So he tried to take all those possibilities into account uh, to find some just way of dealing with the problem. Still, what he remembered uh, was that his former employees wouldn't shake his hand after what has happened. Um, and even though uh, he understood that it was not him letting them go, but it was the system uh, for, for the employees, uh, it, it was, uh, the burden was too much even to, to shake his hand. Uh, so, that was about the personal, uh, as we call it, personal cuts layoffs. But um, the book, the term cuts denotes not only um, downsizing, but much more. It's worth to, uh, I will talk now about um, spatial infra infrastructural cuts, because it's worth to remember that while in capitalist logic, the reason to be of an enterprise is to generate profit. Um, in socialist regime, industrial sites were also institutions of welfare state, um, providing housing, childcare, uh, medical care, vocational education uh, through company schools or scholarships, financial and material support, holidays and entertainment with chess clubs, fishing clubs, film screenings, um, famous mushroom tours, grzybobrania, uh, tourist organizations, etc. Um, and in new economic regime, uh, it became a, fi a financial and organizational burden, of course, which had to be cut off. One of our interviewees uh, recall it as cutting of the grapes. Um, so holiday resorts and residential uh, buildings were sold. Nurseries, kindergartens, medical services liquidated. Spaces intended for entertainment, social meetings, chess clubs, etc., changed their function. Um, suddenly, after the renovation, radio station could not find a place to broadcast. Um, large common canteens were closed um, and smaller social rooms created. Spatial cuts, together with increasing restrictions uh, regarding moving around uh, the plant, created physical barriers for interaction and uh, reproduction of social, um, social bonds, social practices and social bonds. And final dimension, dimension of cuts is um, cultural. Uh, it regards habits, norms and values. So uh, the old ways, uh, were perceived by the new uh, management and in general in public discourse um, as obstacles um, on the way to progress and development. Um, of course, some old customs were, um, were criticized by the workers like uh, drinking on the premise of the plant. Um, but in general, um, they didn't approve uh, this attitude of total negation of what was anchored in the past. Um, and a good, a good example uh, is the criteria of workers' assessment, uh, concluding very often in layoffs. Suddenly, youth and lack of experience became more valued. It was much easier to hire young, unexperienced people and to shape them in Western ways uh, than to work with the old resources. Uh, older workers resisted it, referring to the value of loyalty, commitment, um, their institutional uh, and contextual knowledge, but in vain. Uh, so to summarize, uh, those cuts referred to people, spaces, practices, norms and values resulted in erosion of social bonds. And social bonds are focal points um, of one of the dominant ways of remembering and recalling the structuring processes. Um, so now I would uh, I will move to the question of how, and this part will be shorter <laughs> because I, I see that I'm a bit late. Uh, so um, what we observed. Um, uh, during our project was uh, and listening to the interviews was a rupture between two dominant narrations. 
the first narration uh, we call a modernization discourse. And um, it, simply, uh, it simply reflects what uh, we know as a neoliberal discourse with its focus on uh, profit, efficiency, uh, employment, rationalization, etc. cetera. Uh, the second uh, discourse um, we call moral economy. Um, the concept uh, derives from E.P. Thompson theory, and maybe it's not very intuitive, but it's actually about uh, what I've already talked, social bonds and decay of the community, decay of norms, values, etc. Um, this is important that in our case, um, it was expressed in what we call nostalgia. I hope we'll have time to talk about it. Nostalgia for some aspects of life and work uh, under socialism. Um, and what's happening with those discourses? Uh, so what we've noticed that they, um, they, uh, they are present uh, in the stories in a specific way. I mean, they're overlapping, uh, coexisting. Um, in, even in one story, it, it very often happened that in one story, we had those two discourses overlapping, but with no bridges uh, between them. Um, our interviewees moved from one to the other, often with contradictory emotions, hesitation, uncertainty in judgment. Um, and that is why we claim that uh, they did not cope with successfully with this experience um, well, in terms of discourse and in terms of narration. And it also shows the deficits of public debate, uh, which was, as Asha um, said, ideologically biased, uh, dichotomous and oversimplifying, oversimplifying the challenges. And it left people with doubts, uh, with hard feelings, resentment, regrets, and with questions, had it really to happen exactly this way? Um, so I think I would just say one final sentence um, that um, the transformation is commonly regarded as closed chapter. Uh, nevertheless, we hope uh, we not only contributed to the discussion about the past, but also about our present. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving uh, both this, this um, introduction to, uh, to the book and its methodological and theoretical underpinnings, what Joanna did, and then to give us, to bring us closer to the materials so uh, that Alexander did. Um, I'll start us with um, a couple questions that, um, that, that have to do with your data. And uh, perhaps the first is about how you recruited the interviewees. You have 130. For those of you who don't do research, uh, the people uh, listening, I mean, this, this is a very, it's, it's a large sample. Um, so I'm curious to see how you recruited these people, um, how perhaps also they, they were uh, selected, but how different they were based on on um, their, you talked about their age, but their age, gender, place of residence, not only political affiliation, but religiosity, um, the region, for example, perhaps also the, the domain in which they worked, because that might also shape their experience of the transition. Um, so that's one, the first part of the question. And the other uh, relates to what uh, Joanna said in the introduction that students also participated in the interview process and uh, how you dealt with the different kinds of narration that could emerge uh, from, um, from uh, being interviewed by someone much younger to whom you have to explain all sorts of things. You cannot take as a given that the person will understand how the, you know, the factory shop worked, for example, um, versus explaining it to someone that was, is conversant or also experienced that period or have close ones who worked in it. So it's about recruiting your, your interviewees, um, the interview process and, you know, the different uh, differences between your interviewees or also the intersectionality of being, for example, 
uh, a woman living in the countryside might be different than uh, you know an urban male worker, for example. So two or three questions and one that will allow you to kind of get to the data. Who wants to take who, a stab at an answer first? Maybe Joanna, since you have okay. <laughs> okay, it's always difficult on Zoom when you have two speakers and then. Okay, so I start and all I will um Mm, will then intervene perhaps with some additional insight. So, I mean, the project was kind of the work in progress. So we just, we wanted to start with a um, one site uh, factory, which is called the Wegdel factory in Poland, which is a chocolate factory and also one of the, um, one I would say of the flagship factories in the term of its symbolic load, because it has been, uh, it has been open already in the 19th century and it has this you know long 20th century pre pre second world war story of the family of vedels uh, building that uh, sweet factory in poland and it was nationalized and then privatized at the beginning of the 90s interestingly first sold to PepsiCo, you know, which is not that famous of uh, of doing chocolates. Um, then uh, it was taken over by Cadbury, and the Cadbury uh, uh, was bought by other, uh, you know, so that the Cadbury ceased to exist. And afterwards, it was sold to Kraft. After Kraft, to uh, uh, to the Lotto Group, which is an Asian company. So it kind of this, you know, that that factory, which was kind of the lieu de memoir, you know, in Poland, as 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 it comes to the uh, uh industrial sector and especially the food sector and the sweet sector became a part of this casino capitalism of the um of the post 1989 period and we thought it's just interesting to see how the um, uh, how the how the employees of that factory not only like shop floor workers but you know different people who used to work there see that experience and we uh, basically you know our first question was how they actually remember at least 1980s and 1990s. And this is how we started to recruit our uh, interviewees by a snowball method, trying to have them diverse um, people from the management, but also from trade unions, from the, um, from the shop floor and so on. After that, uh, um, uh, what took us two years, right? <laughs> after, after collecting these uh, interviews, we did uh, pretty much the same thing with the steel uh, or, or steel yard, which is also in Warsaw, because the federal factory, the sweet factory, uh, even though you know, of course, it had some male employees, it was mainly uh, um, employed by women, and the steel, the steel factory was very much the, the male, uh, the male place. And after uh, after that, we just expanded. <laughs> so we expanded to the twelve. Uh, to all together, we have the uh, twelve factories from the very different sites in Poland, and that was actually uh, Alexandra with um, uh, our colleagues who work on. Um, actually mapping those uh, uh, factories which we wanted to have in a sample based on several criteria so one was of them was really important was the new foreign owner because we all in all of these cases we concentrated on those factories which were as in case of Vedel, which i described which were sold to the multinationals but we wanted to have a diverse multinationals so all our mentioned at the uh, very beginning Michelin, right, which bought the uh, the, the Olsten factory, the tire factory, but, uh, you know, the, the PepsiCo was, the Vedel was bought by uh, Pe uh, PepsiCo, which is very much American, you know, in the, in the, uh, the sense of the corporate culture, we did have a German, Asian and other owners. So what is really interesting, and we just didn't have time to expand on it, what what are the cultural encounters between the newcomers and also the staff which comes to from abroad, like Koreans to the FSO factory, the car factory, um, in the midst of uh, you know bits of post-socialist Warsaw, and the local staff, and also the diverse uh, organizational cultures of the um, of the foreign companies. So, well, the selection criteria was the branch, right? So that we had different, like the heavy industry, food, uh, light industry, food and industry, and so on, but also the um, uh, the country of origin of the multinational, which was in the corporate culture of the origin. And as to the interviewees, just on the final note, because I can continue on that forever. It's a really important. Um, 
Uh, it tells us a lot about uh, how the um, uh, transformation went on, and especially transformation in the industrial sector at the beginning of the 1990s in Poland, because it was really, I mean, it was fast. And because it was fast, it was very chaotic. So it's not that all of this industrial side have a proper archive kept. And only if we would have archives, we would have an access to the um, strata of the social strata of the um, of the employees working there. So we probably, if you had such an access, we could, you know, make our samples more, uh, you know, really speaking to um, uh, to the employment structure of the let's say 1990s, if we were interested in that. But that happened in a in a few cases and uh, just it's it's it also it's an interesting anecdote that that was for instance the french employers who always gave the the archives of the uh, of the new company to uh, to the local archives americans sorry to say didn't care <laughs> so then there was quite a, a mess about that so what we really wanted to have is just to go with the snowball and to have an access to to a different um uh, to to interviews with different insight uh, to the factories. Sorry, I don't know. Perhaps Ola would like to add more to that. Uh, yes, I would like to add some information um, about the criteria. Uh, so, what was very important for us that we didn't want to make a study of a um, particular branch or particular region. So, uh, we want to have. Uh, as um, the most diverse uh, sample as uh, it was possible in the case of um, such a research. Uh, so um, the company, um, one, one uh, selection, one, uh, one criteria selection was um, uh, the company um, uh, that took uh, an enterprise, but also the history of an enterprise. So we had the battle and um, maybe one more with uh, um, origins uh, before the uh, First uh, World War. And uh, we had enterprises which were like a typical socialist um, initiatives, uh, huge industrial sites uh, with all this uh, infrastructure. Uh, so we looked for um, enterprises in different regions uh, so we had cities with many other companies, uh, not co companies, not a good word in this uh, context, but enterprises, as well as uh, companies which were uh, almost the only employee in the region. Uh, so I think uh, those two, uh, those criteria are also important. Uh, we want to talk, and we succeeded in it, I think, uh, with um, different kind of workers from shop floor workers through administrative staff, um, skilled, unskilled workers, uh, management, um, uh, also uh, trades union represent representatives. Um, yeah. So, yeah. That's, mm -hmm. so and my question then would be, the follow up would be then did you notice patterns between because because what your your the detail that you're giving us now i mean it's very impressive the number of factories that you that you included in your sample uh, the different kind of factories with different histories and i think it's very very interesting and important i'm glad that uh, joanna talked about this that the fact that they were taken over by different multinationals or with different kind of, of management styles. Uh, so then my the follow-up question would be, so did you see differences in how people remembered both their work and the transition? Um, and related to this, then was there more nostalgia for one type of factory workers um, versus another one? I mean, does was there a difference if you were taken over by Michelin versus uh, PepsiCo and then Kraft? Was there a difference, you think? Was that, did it have an impact on how people remembered the socialist period and a transition? Because your data is just unbelievable. 
I mean, if to simplify it, I mean, it, it's also, I mean, sometimes it's not that easy because also the companies, you know, change afterwards. So Michelin case is actually nice to talk about it. And also Ola might want to jump in later on because she was very closely analyzing the, the, the interviews from her. But it actually worked, right? But it worked. And my hint to that, I mean, my interpretation would be that it was very much paternalistic at the very beginning. So it kind of uh, spoke to that what people expected on the ground. So they were kind of expecting, you know, this caring father, I would say, who would take out and clean up, you know, kind of the mess of the uh, of the of the eighties and the beginning of the nineties. Uh, and of course, but there were of course. Um, uh, problems and expectations, you know, very diverse in terms of, uh, let's say, I would say situatedness of our um, interviewees, which kind of goes across uh, the factories and are independent of the corporate cultures of the new owners. So um, when we speak about the patterns of nostalgia, which I can also speak forever, so you can stop me. Uh, one is, you know, one is a very, it's a very different pattern of nostalgia, for instance, of the engineers, uh, who kind of benefited from the transformation as such. So they were not the one who were, you know, who were, who were being cut off. But uh, it's interesting, but because the, 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 <laughs> the space for their own creativity was reduced. <laughs> because, you know, as you know, the, the economy of shortages work in such a way that you needed to have a clever people underground who knew who knew how to fix that old Italian machine for whom, you know, the, 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 in the 80s, there was no money to replace with, you know, a new one. So, you know, the agency was important in the place. And they kind of felt, uh, you know, deprived of that kind of the agency, even though economically, technically, they really benefited from uh, from the new uh, from the new employers, and they they also kind of express this you know this type of nostalgia for the national <laughs> for the national economy, which is uh, it's in the diverse ways that the people you know the women and the shop floor workers and so on uh, express the nostalgia as you can imagine and we could just go on and go on talking about that i just stop on this engineer's example Hola. um Yes, uh, because uh, of the material and its nature, it's um, always difficult for us to uh, to conclude quickly <laughs> and to have a simple uh, answer. But what I think is, um, we of course um, observed differences um, uh, because of the um, uh, of the nature of the corporation and its logic, its philosophy. Um, but uh, on one hand, but on the other, it's um, capitalistic logic uh, what, uh, what wins in the end. So um, it's, I would say that it's a pleasure to observe how people um, tried to use the discourses of new companies um, to, combine, to combine it with what they knew. For example, in case of Vedel, uh, when PepsiCo came with no experience in uh, chocolate uh, business and uh, the Vettel company had like 100, almost 50 years of experience. Um, so uh, they were, um, I mean, they were negatively, um, they, they reacted negatively to this company, but uh, then they changed their mind, as they recall it, of course, uh, because they let them do their job. They didn't have experience, so they didn't interfere. Uh, so they could uh, be Vedel. Uh, and then Cadbury came, an English company with very uh, similar origins and history as Vedal did. And they tried to compare uh, those histories to show uh, that uh, they were parallel, like twins, um, and to mix Cadbury with Vedal, uh, what was also very negatively perceived uh, because it was uh, um, endangering the identity of Vedal. That's one example. Uh, Michelin was uh, in a way very uh, paternalistic company. Um, Michelin was a 
person in charge. It wasn't like an abstract company. It was embodied by Francois Michelin, who came by himself to Alston, who visited the workshop, talked with the workers, um, and uh, that was perceived by uh, by the workers like, okay, we have new uh, gospodas. It's uh, I don't know what would be the English uh, equivalent for gospodash, but like a good host, like a father, um, caring, understanding, etc. Uh, so it played a role, of course, in how people tried to uh, to think about their situation and uh, to adapt to their situation. But still, I would say that the experiences in this, the most general uh, dimension were in the end very similar. We have several questions. Uh, your presentations was very engaging. So we have interesting questions. I'm gonna try to um, put them together. Um, so one is actually from, the two are related to uh, how you can move beyond the Polish case and what Joanna said in introduction, you know, that we're right next door to Detroit here in Ann Arbor. Uh, so one is by Zbigniew Pasek, who is a UM alum and who worked in Ursus uh, when he was a student in the mid 1970s. And his question is related to Michigan. He says, workers in Michigan are familiar with, with these types of transformations most recently conducted as a result of globalization and massive offshoring to Southeast Asia, for example, China, not to mention previous waves of changes captured by Roger Moore and Roger and Me documentary, which I'm showing to my students on Tuesday. Um, it's on Marx, my lecture on Marx. So it's always the most vulnerable who carry the brunt of the costs and impact of such changes. The key question is what are the lessons for those who may be most affected when facing future transformations? And before you answer, I want to also mention the comment that Patrice Dombrowski made um, and where she's asking if you also interviewed people uh, who lost their jobs or only those who were retained so that their experience was um, uh, different. So the what kind of losers of the transitions um, you, uh, you interviewed? I can ask Joanna uh. or Ola, who wants to go first. You no, just need to, just you need like to decide. Question. Maybe I will start with the second question because it's simpler. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, yes, yes, uh, and that's a very important observation that we talked with people who stayed and uh, that we talked with people who work in companies who, uh, in most cases, uh, succeeded. Um, in the terms of, of course, uh, um, the global market competition, not personalized, maybe. Um, so it's important to, to remember about it. It was simply difficult to, uh, to reach people who were dismissed in the early 90s, uh, because we started the project in 2010. Uh, we tried, uh, but it could not be a, a huge, we, we couldn't get um, an important uh, representation of people who were dismissed. However, uh, we talked with some, um, for example, while um, being in uh, residential buildings in the cities uh, where the companies had uh, their uh, their buildings, um, we, we tried to reach them in different manners. Um, and we had some short conversation. And uh, for example, my experience uh, was uh, that uh, the regrets and anger uh, was so huge that it was really impossible to talk with them about what really happened. Uh, and not to talk about their views, opinions, and emotions. Uh, it wouldn't be bad, of course, but it would be a different uh, research project. Okay, so I hope uh, I satisfied um, with the answer. I said the second, the first question was much more um, 
opening for a long talk. So you, you, you think that I should restrain myself and not to give a long talk. I try. Uh, well, thank you so much. And, and, and first of all, thank you so much to Zbigniew Pasek for sharing his, his personal <laughs> experience. But of course, you know, we don't have a, you know, if we had an answer, <laughs> we could get a Nobel Prize for, for that. But what, what our project shows, and it clearly shows that uh, you, you could, and it's imaginable that you handle the same processes with more care and less care. So that uh, the, the companies to survive on, on the labor market, because what is interesting about uh, our project is that we um, kind of focus on those industrial sites which survived, although they were severely downsized. And in the situation of this neoliberal turn, they needed to be downsized because otherwise it, was, it wouldn't be possible to keep them in the market. But you could do the layoffs in such a way that they contributed to the mutual distrust of the local, uh, of the, especially if they were in the local, you know, in the small towns, but also, you know, in, <laughs> in industrial districts as in Poland, the mutual distrust um, and so on. And you can handle them in such a way that the people feel that there is some um, rationality and perhaps some justice uh, behind uh, uh, or, or the behind uh, some decision which were um, which were taken and so that's that's probably you know one of the most obvious lessons that when you need to downsize something you just need to uh, care about the people whom uh, whom you put uh, behind and how you do that and that what are our what what is the, the stories which we showed they showed that that was very much missing uh, from the the factor which was really missing from the um, uh, from the process uh, in the 1990s in, in Poland. So that was a short answer. Well, uh, I can actually extend what you just explained and um, and ask Kasia Ketlinska's uh, question, which is, you know, how much do you see basically how those layoffs and those cuts happen both on, you know, in the workplace, but also in the domestic sphere, like uh, Ola was describing, how the workplace was also the welfare state in action, right? With housing and leisure and childcare and, and et cetera. So to what extent do you see how the transition happened um, and the rise of populism? And of course, others have um, also talked about this, including, uh, I think that we had Ost here. Uh, was listening, I think he might still be. So how do you see the rise of populism? You know, is, there, is it a direct, direct ca causation or? Um... Of course, we always get that question <laughs> and it's uh, nowadays and it's always very difficult to answer indirectly. So um, of course, there are some interviewees and that was really uh, interesting because we started the interviews um, before uh, the law and justice took over the power. So there were some interviews who were waiting for change and uh, they could benefit from uh, from that change in um, uh, in many ways. So that's, uh, that's the thing, but we didn't really study, you know, that, that was not our research question, <laughs> you know, the, the populism and so on. So I can just go on with anecdotes from the, you know, individual life stories, but there is no pattern which I would could responsibly, you know, answer your question. But what I think uh, the, the, the way the transformation was handled, I think it generally in a way it affected the Polish society, it affected with a high level of stress, right? So this is what, and this, I think that the impact and the effects of that we can feel on our lives today. You know, my, especially my generation, the generation who entered the labor market in the 90s, 90s, it was very diffi difficult to get in because of the unemployment. For those who were struggling, you know, to survive, as many of our interviewees says, uh, I survive, I cope with the system, I learn, I learn languages, I learn the digital technologies, because we need to remember that all these processes, they, you know, they uh, happen simultaneously. So it's not just a transformation from socialist capitalism, for this to post for this, but also this is a digital revolution. And it's a, re a revolution of skills which are required from the workers. And if you are, um, you know, a single mother, uh, from a small town, 
and you have to support your five children, you just cope, right? Uh, and uh, so then, so the stories of stress, right? This, these are, these are, and this is what have actually, I think, um, stayed uh, with us and in the families and so on. The way of coping with stress. Also, when when we look at some of the managers, tell them what they do. They, you know, they. They say they had to do that, and you can take. There was no alternative, you know. There's this Tina, you know, <laughs> narrative, which is there, and probably there was no alternative. But still, you know, there is no, um, uh, no a bigger reflection, I would say, about how, uh, um, about what it actually means for the, um, or it deserves a bigger uh, reflection, what that Tina means for the. Um, uh, generation general emotional uh, impact on the Polish society um, as such and also the way you know the, the next uh, the way we reform <laughs> public policy uh, uh, enterprises and so on afterwards so there is that general feeling that you have to do it fast right the transformation was done fast so when we reform I don't know higher education right now we also try to do it fast <laughs> so then there is also this legacy, very strange legacy, I would say, of, of, of doing transformation right now, which perhaps is not that necessary. And, you know, in a very general sense, of course, it impacted populism, because that's the defense mechanism of the people that they want to belong somewhere. They want to feel that their workplaces, their localities are there, right? And the populist offers them uh, that promise. Uh, so in that sense, of course, the, the projects in a broader sense, it speaks to the to the changes in the region, but that was not the very research question uh, of us when we did the interviews. Thank you. I think your response now also responds to a question by Brian uh, Porter Schutz, who uh, was asking uh, if you think that your work represents a broader shift in the way these topics um, of, the, of the transition are being discussed nowadays by scholars and among the general uh, public. Um, I think you addressed that, so I won't ask you to comment further. However, you know, you're uh, probably the most distinguished scholar of memory in Poland, so I'd like to hear your thoughts about nostalgia more specifically and um, different types of nostalgia you may have noticed um, in your interviewees. Um, and how that nostalgia is the same or perhaps different from nostalgia for East Germany, for example, or nostalgia for socialism or, you know, the Soviet Union in Russia. Do you want to comment on that a little bit? Well, first of all, I do not agree with being you know, the most distinguished memory scholars. Thank you so much, but I have much well, better okay, colleagues. One of the three, then. I mean. <laughs> Thanks. But uh, yes, yeah, so what because we were, uh, when, when we were, okay, when the book went on the reviews, the reviewers were asking us, what about nostalgia? What would you do with nostalgia? And we, you know, we just didn't want to comment on that, but we had, you know, a couple of articles aside of, um, uh, of the book itself. But the, what we do, you know, in our interpretation is that we follow those scholars, uh, like, I don't know, Stefan Berger in Germany or um, Laura Jane Smith, I think she did um, uh, not an interview project, but she followed the heritage sites um, in Australia, UK and, and other countries, which showed the critical potential of nostalgia. So a kind of, you know, trying to develop, you know, that long uh, um, lasting uh, influence of uh, Svetlana Bo Boim, uh, you know, the um, distinction between restorative and reflexive nostalgia, and what does it actually mean to have a reflexive nostalgia today, what does it mean for the industrial sector, for what does it mean for the industrialization, what does it mean for the, let's say, post <laughs> neoliberal, uh, neoliberalism where we would like to find, find ourselves. So, well, the, you know, the, the, the stories which we collected, they have some elements of this restorative nostalgia, and uh, it's very simple in fact, saying it was better to live under socialism. But many of them are critical of socialism and they're also critical of the present. They just, uh, you know, dwell in these two periods of time 
to show what are the best moments, you know, of uh, of being a worker, of being a mother, of being, you know, of being a, a pole uh, in in the different moments of the time. So I would say that that, that critical yeah, potential of nostalgia, this is what is really uh, in the book, you know, in, if when you read the interviews, you can see, you can see, uh, you can see the, uh, how it is being used as a um, narrative tool by the, uh, by, by our interview. Viewees. And as to patterns, you know, you can you can look as I said at the beginning there are, there are the, the nostalgic that the story is framed by it depends who says that. So the engineers they will have a different types of nostalgia. The female shop uh, uh, shop floor workers they will you know they will also have a kind of a different type of uh, nostalgia because they will more long for the security. And, and less than uh, less and the others. It's also perhaps interesting that there is also some nostalgia for the 1990s. So that it's not that it's just a total critique of that, but the the 90s are sometimes often seen as a kind of an adventure of you know making your new self <laughs> thanks to the opportunities which were uh, given uh, at that time. So that's uh, I think that's just an, you know just giving a, a very basic answer to to the very complex question. Uh, oh, wait. Um, okay, I have another question uh, by Kevin Duggan, who's asking, um, and I think that might be also for Alexandra to answer that one. So people seem to be nostalgic for this period under socialism because they, they struggle to deal with this decay of social norms. But he questions why this would not increase the social interactions that occurred within the secondhand market during socialism. Would there not be such uh, interactions now that they are no longer illegal? Or do people believe that this shift to commodity exchange under communism led to more terminal social relationships driven by, solely by profit? Mm -hmm. I'll try. However, I'm not sure if I understood the question well, the intention. Um, uh, but- feel, uh, free, feel free to rephrase interpret. it. Interpret, <laughs> yes, of course. Um, we talk about the case of uh, huge industrial sites uh, where this formal and informal um, contexts were uh, overlapping, I would say, as well. So on the one hand, we had this, um, all this, uh, what I call uh, after Naroyek, um, welfare state institutions, but we also had the spaces for um, bottom-up initiatives and um, uh, and creativity and agency actually uh, what was one of my discoveries um, for example as a person born in 1985 uh, so I do not remember uh, this period by myself um, so um, they uh, actually what they experienced in their uh, workplaces was uh, was a limitation of interactions. Um, for example, they couldn't move um, around the plant. They couldn't talk while walking. Uh, the discipline um, increased, um, and uh, most of the workers, um, especially of the um, not of the highest rank. Uh, they didn't have time for other social interactions uh, after work. Uh, they had to um, try to meet the end. Uh, end. Uh, so um, I think that that was the, the, the space they practiced um, community. Uh, they practiced the social bonds, and uh, uh, suddenly it was not impossible anymore. Uh, not at all, of course, but uh, you f I hope you feel that it was much limited. Uh, the work, work pressure was uh, also huge, of course, because of the uh, risk of um, dismissal. So um, as one of our interviewees, I remember uh, she said, Mr. Robinson, uh, Robinson from USA, uh, Mr. Robinson called that he will be uh, in the office at 8 or 9 p.m. So, and uh, uh, would I wait? Uh, and what should I, 
I mean, I, I had to wait. So there was no other way uh, to keep my job. I had to wait for him till 9 p.m. Uh, so that's the context uh, of their everyday life. Uh, and um, most of the day they spend in such a context. So I would say that uh, in the context of our research, this uh, the spaces that uh, that was mentioned in the question didn't play a role, actually. I have a question of clarification um, by one guest who's asking, um, actually, if you did look at uh, at uh, companies, workplaces that were uh, that remained Polish, or they were all multinational, and if there were that were that remained Polish, was there a difference between those that were taken over by multinational corporations and those that remained Polish? Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, yes. <laughs> if I may, uh, because I think it's, a, it's an absolutely great question and good point and that one uh, moment I just reflected if we shouldn't start another project just to compare it. But, you know, our initial question was how, how the multinationals differ. Uh, in the you know the effect of the corporate culture differs in Poland and that was already a lot right so to to see uh, to see that we just also wanted to see the Polish uh, to look for the for the moments of the encounter of the uh, of the Polish uh, let's say work ethos and all these you know huge state-owned enterprises with the uh, globalizing efforts of the of the multinationals so we thought that that's really interesting for the oral history projects so to see how it how it worked uh, and then also how it was reworked as a life um, experience so that's why we framed that project as as this one but of course right now it's open for the comparisons with the um, uh, with the polish um, enterprises and so on but i would say that here the results would be um, less surprised i mean quite obvious I would I would suggest and of course there was a huge research on on, on the small and, um, and medium Polish enterprises also on the foreign enterprises by the uh, by the sociologists in the 1990s but we were interested in that memory impact and we thought that for the memory impact that you know encounter between the foreign cultures and the Polish cultures is just interesting to see how it works. There's a couple more questions that just came in and we won't have time to, um, you won't I won't have time to pose them and you won't have time to answer, but we will send them to you in case one is by Mikoy uh, Kunitsky. So perhaps you can um, answer him uh, personally. Um, but before uh, we conclude, I'd like to ask if there's an English version of the book that's in the work. We'd love to read in English, and then there's a couple uh, guests here who actually asked about that and really hope to be able to read in English. I'm actually hesitant if it's going to work for the uh, in English language because it's so much, you know, Polish experience on court. So, and this is what really makes the book is two. It's the two thirds, as I said, of life stories, interviews, and the, the fact that we juxtapose, you know, the, the stories of those who who were led off and those who were responsible for laying off that so they can read you know the you know the, the accounts of the same events from different experience but that could be i think too much you know anchored in the very polish specificities and localities that to be digestible for 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 let's say an international reader but of course we are working you know in some different way of telling the same story uh, in a in a different and more accountable you know understandable and universal way than it is now. Okay, so you're going to rework the data, perhaps to say the bigger stories, you know, for people who don't read Polish, and we hope to see that book uh, available in the next, it always takes time, so maybe in the next couple of years? Let's hope so. That would be wonderful. Um, I want to thank both of you for uh, taking time from you know, your busy schedule. And I know that uh, with quarantine, COVID, children, work, it's very difficult for you also to be here uh, after hours. So we're very grateful. Um, and uh, we hope that you'll be back then to present uh, your next project on, uh, on memory and on uh, work. 
I think uh, Ola wanted to say something. Do you want to offer final comments? You're muted. No, I'm sorry. Uh, the hand, I don't know where did it come from. Okay. okay. <laughs> Here we go. But of course, I would like to say that I feel that we have just uh, begun the discussion. <laughs> so I really regret it cannot continue. Well, I mean, manner. you mm -hmm. have to, to think of this as an amuse, amuse bush. You know, people are here, they hear about uh, the book. Our goal is to make them, give them the incentive to go and purchase the book. It's published by Kritika Polityczna. You can go on their website. You can probably get it also on Amazon. So I encourage those of you who speak Polish to actually um, read the book. Um, it's a fascinating story and analysis. And thank you very much uh, for being here with us today. And I'd like to invite also our um, friends of uh, the Copernicus Center for Polish Studies to come for uh, our coming attractions because we have a very full semester and I'm just going to give you an idea of what we're having this semester. So the um, University of Michigan Musical Society is, um, uh, is staging Fiddler on the Roof on February 18 and 19 and we have organized in collaboration with UMS um, uh, an exhibition of Polish posters of the play and the film, uh, which can be seen on the fifth floor of the International Institute. So it's called Fiddle on the Roof, a story Poland told on Polish posters. And it's, we open on February 1st and you can see it until March 18th. Uh, we also organized uh, a round table from there to here, the Yiddish origins and cultural travels of Fiddle on the Roof. Uh, with Yiddishists Misha Krutikov, Anita Norwich, both from U of M, and, but also Karolina Szymaniak from Warsaw. Uh, we have a discussion, a roundtable discussion uh, on the refugee crises in contemporary Europe from the English Channel to the Polish Belarusian uh, border with John A. Young, who is a senior staff development officer of the UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees. On March 7, I don't have a title yet, but on March 7, Anda Rotenberg will give the annual Copernicus lecture. So we're thrilled about that. Um, and then we have another book club series with uh, Adam Leszczynski, How to Write History from Below and Why It Matters, uh, a conversation that will be led by Brian Portershoots on March 16. And on April 16, we'll conclude the semester with a screening of Vesele by uh, Wojtek uh, Szmazowski at the Michigan Theater. So all the details of all those, I don't expect you to remember those dates, um, but you can go to our website and see uh, and the specific dates and titles and participants. And we hope to see you all uh, to, to our next event on February 16th, the panel on the Yiddish origins and cultural travels of Fiddler on the Roof. Thank you everyone for coming, for being here. Have a great weekend. Um, and thank you, of course, to our speaker, uh, Alexandra Lake and Joanna Wawrzeniak.